Hello everybody. Of all the talks that I do, this is my favourite. If you say, well, why is that? Well, honestly, everybody, the slides are so beautiful that they will speak for themselves. And all I've got to do is point out various things here on the screen. So I think the Impressionists are the most beautiful group of artists who've ever lived. Although, I actually start off by showing you one of my own paintings, or rather, three of my own paintings, but I immediately say, I don't want you to look at the paintings. What I want you to look at is the frame, because this idea of three pictures in one frame is called a triptych. And I've loved making triptychs ever since I was a student. Now, the other reason I love this particular lecture is because it's based in the very centre of Paris. And I think if you look at these fo this photograph and you look at the cars here, this must have been taken in the 50s when I went to Paris for the very first time. And honestly, unlike London, Paris really is an easy city to find your way around. You have the Arc de Triomphe. That runs into the Champs-Élysées and that runs into the Tuileries Gardens. It really is such a wonderful way. And if you carry on down through this boulevard of trees here, you actually come across the Louvre itself. It really is, unlike London, it is just so easy to find your way around. Look, there's the Arc de Triomphe, there's the Champs-Élysées, there are the Tuileries Gardens. The Eiffel Tower was built on that particular position there. But in the Tuileries Gardens, there is in fact a gallery which is here. Now, it's called the Jeu de Pomme. That actually means game of tennis. I must say, it doesn't look much like a tennis court to me, but that's what it's called. And I went there for the very first time in the 1950s. And down in the basement, in the dark, underneath the stairs... I came across a triptych. Now, it's a very dark slide because you weren't supposed to take photographs in the Museum d'Orsay. So, what I had in fact, and the de Pomme. So, what I had in fact done is I'd put the camera on the camera strap inside my neck and I tried to take a joining pair of photographs. But you see, they don't join very well because what I did is I had the camera inside my Mac. And I opened my Mac, went click, moved over, opened my Mac and went click. And because I wasn't looking at the viewfinder, it doesn't join very well in the middle. In the 60s, I noticed this triptych move from the basement up to the daylight galleries. And here's a much better pair of joining photographs. Now, it really is amazing, these three pictures in one frame. I wasn't aware at the time, are these pictures by the same person? Are they by three different people? I was just fascinated. It was three pictures in one frame. Now, the Jeu de Palme was a really small gallery. So, as the Impressionist exhibition grew and grew and grew, the Parisians needed a much larger museum. So what they did was, they took a railway station, the Gare d'Orsay, and they converted it into a museum. And it really was a superb conversion from a railway station into a museum. They built a Millennium Bridge, which never wobbled, so people could walk from the Tuileries Gardens. When you're in the Tuileries Gardens, the Seine is running along here. You simply walk over the Millennium Bridge and you go into the Museum d'Orsay. And it really is a most exciting gallery. You see, what they've done is they've kept the nature of the railway station. You see, this would have been open-ended and this is where the, and the, and the trains would have gone down to the south of France and this is where the platforms would have been which is now converted into a superb sculpture area. Now, you take the escalators up and you go up into the Impressionist galleries. And now, given a pride of place, is that particular triptych. Now, there isn't a lot that I can tell you about this particular triptych. There is a small plaque alongside it. It's obviously in French and I've translated it into English. The plaque reads, the donation of Ernest May, 
that it can be used by the museum, but in no way must it be damaged or changed. And it was initially given to the Louvre in 1926. The Louvre obviously administer all the main galleries in Paris. Now, I don't know who Ernest May is. Is he linked to Bryant and May? After all, May does not sound like a French name. So is he linked to Bryant and May, the match people? Do you know, I spend a whole afternoon in the bibliotheque part of the Museum d'Orsay. And I went through endless file cards and I only came across Ernest May's name once. And this is the French for what I've just read to you. The donation of Ernest May that it can be used by the museum but in no way must it be damaged or changed. Now, in the bibliotheque part of the museum, I was able to find out that he bought the three paintings, I mean, he may have bought more than three paintings on that day, on the 4th of June, 1890. He then realised that they were the same size and he had them put together in the year 1900. And as I said, he gave them initially to the Louvre in 1926. I hope one day to earn, learn who Ernest May is, because he's a genius putting those three pictures together in one frame. But to my, come to my subject for today. This book is what it says it is. It's a dictionary of art and artists by Peter and Linda Murray. And it literally is a reference book. There's no illustrations. I have it in my pocket whenever I go around visiting various galleries. It names all the main groups of artists who've ever lived together and worked together and all the major artists who've ever lived and worked together. Now, if in this dictionary you look up Impressionism, this is what it says. A movement in painting originating in France in the 1860s. The artists shared outlooks and techniques, and they grouped together for the purpose of exhibiting. Cézanne, Degas, Manet, Monet, Pissarro, Renoir, Sisley were the most important. They reacted against academic doctrines and tried to depict contemporary life in a new objective manner by rendering an impression of what the eye sees at one particular moment. In this, they were influenced by scientific study, which demonstrates that colour was not in an object, but the outcome of the way light is reflected from it, thus a matter of constant change. Now, I cannot say that's a very complicated sentence, but you know what that means when I come to the end of this presentation. Landscape and painting out of doors became one of the hallmarks of Impressionism. Constable and Turner were seen as precursors. Monet, after whose Impression Sunrise the movement was named, is often considered the Impressionist par excellence because his commitment to his ideas was total throughout his career and he developed them most single-mindedly. Pissarro was the only artist who exhibited in all the Impressionist exhibitions and as a figure was central to and much respected by the movement. They were at first generally mocked and attacked because of the high-keyed colour and lack of finish. After the final Impressionist exhibition, the group dissolved. The influence of the group was enormous. Indeed, it was the most important phenomenon to come out of the 19th century. Now, I'd only add, really, that they are the most important group and most successful group of artists who've ever worked together. Why do I say that? A few years ago at the Royal Academy Gallery, there was a one-man exhibition of, of Monet's paintings. Now, because of the demand for tickets for that exhibition, they had the gallery open throughout the night. It was wonderful at three o'clock at night going round looking at the Monet's paintings. That's the only time, they've never done it since, to have the galleries open throughout the whole of the night. But in this script, it mentions a whole list of artists. Cézanne, Degas, Manet, Monet, Pissarro, Renoir, Sisley. Rubbish. There are, in fact, only three Impressionists. And those three Impressionists are here in Ernest May's triptych. Now, the first one is the wonderfully delicate and gentle Alfred Sisley. He always has the bank 
going off on the left hand side. He then springs a low horizon line across from that with a large expanse of sky directly above water. The Ile Saint Denis, painted in 1872, is a superb example of Alfred Sisley's painting. Camille Pissarro, on the hand, loves to sit on a roadway, so the road takes your eye into the very centre of the painting. He then has tall trees on either side, usually without leaves, acting as a kind of framework on either side of the painting. And if those trees can cast shadows, he'll use those shadows to step your eye into the painting. He loves having figures in his paintings, a cart and a horse, a little figure alongside here. The entrance to the village of Voisin is a superb example of Camille Pissarro's painting. And finally, the great Claude Monet. The Monet had a boat made as a studio, so you could drift the boat out into the Seine, throw the anchor over so you're fully in the water itself. A sky with a light cloud and boats. Monet's Boats of Pleasure, also painted in 1872, is a superb example of Monet's painting. And all I'm going to do is talk about Sisley's painting, talk about Pissarro's painting, and talk about Monet's painting. I don't know who Ernest May was, but he's a genius to put these three pictures in one frame and insist they must never be changed. So we come to the three artists. Now, of the three, the least known is Alfred Sisley. But of the three, he's my favourite. Why? He was English. Now, that doesn't make me bias in any way. He really was a superb painter. His parents were English, and he came over to England many, many times. And I'll show you the paintings he did when he came over here to England. His father imported silks from the east into Paris. The bank goes off on the left-hand side. You then have a low horizon line with a large expanse of sky directly above water. The Ile Saint Denis is a superb example of Alfred Sisley's painting. All these artists were born roughly at the same time, 1840. And you know, in those years, you only lived 60 years, so they all died at the turn of the century. Sisley was born in 1839, and he died in 1899. They all lived in Paris and they all worked in a 20 mile radius in the lovely little villages around Paris. As I've said, they all came to England and I'll show you the paintings they did when they came over here. So Alfred Sisley always loves to sit on a river bank. So the bank literally takes you over onto that side of the canvas. He then has a large amount of sky directly above water. His paintings are just absolutely wonderful subjects of sky and of water. He also has a very reserved palette. By that I mean the blue greys and the warm ochres. You know, when I show you Monet, I'll show you pure reds, pure greens, pure blues. And you really will realise just what a delicate palette Alfred Sisley actually had. So the bank goes off on the left-hand side, a low horizon line and a large expanse of sky. Again, you can see the bank goes off on the left-hand side. Now, I've got a theory about this bank. I think Sisley was right-handed, Therefore, you have the palette on your left arm, and then you have the canvas there, so it is natural to look that way down the river. If you turn the whole thing around, you're looking over your palette, and anyway, the canvas is going to get into your way. So that's why I think the bank always goes off on the... You know, I used to think these guys kind of woke up in the morning, they wiped the sleep out of their eyes and walked blindly anywhere and sat down. It's not like that at all. They all had favourite subjects they liked to go and paint and they all had favourite ways of putting the paintings together. Sisley loved sky and he loved water and that's what you see featuring time and time again. Sky and water. Hampton Court on the Thames. Now admittedly it is a different composition that now we're looking directly across the Thames but even so, our main interest is in the buildings, the bridge, and the wonderful reflection at the base of the painting. And can I say, water, which is always moving, is very difficult to paint. 
The way the water moves across the base of Sisley's paintings are absolutely wonderful. Again, a slightly different composition that we do pick up on this side, but then again, our main interest is that side. And look at this, 70% sky, 20% water, and then the final 10% in the buildings themselves. You know, when we look at Pissarro, we won't see any water anywhere. And after a few slides, we won't even see any sky. Sisley loves sky, and he loves water. And that's what he likes to go and paint. Sky, oh, and a favourite impression is sky. The cotton woolly clouds against a pale blue. And look at that wonderfully fluid reflection again at the base of the painting. And again, our more main interest on that left-hand side of the picture and a lovely little Dutch lifting bridge here as well. And you can also see the blue greys and the warm ochres. Sisley is a lovely, delicate and beautiful painter. The regatta at Henley. Now you can well imagine if these eights are rowing by at full speed, they're only going to be there for seconds. So if Sisley's going to paint them, he's got to paint them very, very quickly. But what the critics did, they came and stood where I am and they wanted to see minute detail. You see, again, had he painted these flags in tremendous detail, they would have frozen. The fact that he paints them so loosely feels you can feel them moving in the breeze. And the way you look at Impressionist painting is from where you are. You look at the whole picture and get the whole scene. You don't go looking for details because they're not there. Now, Sisley really is an absolutely beautiful painter, and I like the idea, and I know it happened, that these artists often went in twos and threes to the same location, just to keep each other company for the day. And there's a Monet which would almost fit alongside here. And I love the idea that Monet was painting and just leaned over to Sisley and said, put a little bit more colour on your canvas. Because if you look, that blue is that richer than the blue greys that we've seen. And this rose colour is almost that bit richer than the ochres that we've seen. And again, just look at that water moving across the base of the picture. Painting moving water and capturing the movement in the paintwork is incredibly difficult. Although I must say, I think Sisley's snow paintings are breathtaking. You see, when you're painting out in the winter time, your fingers get cold. So you tend to paint rather quickly. Can you see the speed which all these brushstrokes have been put down? And a real fresh, heavy snowfall. And again, so the painting isn't completely cold, you've got the warm ochres coming into the walls and the little figures here. Now, he spent some of his life living at Moore, which is just a little village at, at, along the side Paris, on the Seine, and he now paints two views of the same subject. Now again, you see, it's Monet who's given all of this credit for literally doing the same scene time and time and time and time again. It's called the series paintings. Now, so they, I will point out to you that they were all doing this, although this one, Sisley has in fact moved his location for the second scene. I think this is the morning painting. If you look, the storm clouds are still overhead, but it's beginning to break above the horizon. So he does this painting in the morning, and then in the afternoon he swings around and does this painting. The storm has now completely blown away. We've got the blue sky and the cotton woolly clouds. So it's not quite a series, but he has in fact moved his viewpoint fractionally. Although the final paintings he did really were a series of paintings. He takes the cathedral at Moray. Now, this is the first painting, or the morning painting, when it is in fact a kind of very grey, it's not raining, look. There's no water here. We've simply got a grey mud. I would call it a very depressing Monday. It's very muddy. It's very depressing. 
But say you took that same church in, say, a late November day. Now, by November, there's no real strength in the sun. So it just drifts across a gentle yellow, almost completely flattening the church itself. And as there's no strength in the sun, you've got no strength in the shadow. It just drifts across a blue-gray. Now, this is what that dictionary of art and artist meant. Colour isn't in an object, but the outcome of the way light is reflected from it, thus a matter of constant change. And you can well imagine a church in the middle of the winter time is going to look very different from that church in the middle of the summer time. And it was these differences that fascinated the Impressionists. And it was wonderful. Just a few years ago, at the Royal Academy Galleries on Piccadilly, in the Secker Galleries, that's the smaller galleries up on the top floor, there was an Alfred Sisley exhibition for the very first time, as far as I know, in London. And I was able to see a whole series of variations of the church at Moray. He did, in fact, do 14 variations of the church, almost taken from exactly the same view. But in the actual catalogue, there was a very sad and moving final sentence. Monet and Pissarro visited Sisley a week before he died, and Pissarro wrote a letter on the very same day. They say that Sisley is gravely ill. He is a fine and great artist. In my opinion, he is a master equal to the greatest. I have seen again some of his works that are rare truth and beauty, including the flood that is a real masterpiece. Now, it's fascinating that, fascinating that it was Monet and Pissarro who visited Sisley a week before he died. And Pissarro, who wrote to a friend saying, Sisley is a master equal to the greatest. Because you see, somebody else knew that, and his name was Ernest May. Because he put Sisley as the first painting alongside Pissarro and alongside Monet. So that's the wonderful, lovely and delicate Alfred Sisley. Camille Pissarro is completely different. He loves to sit on a roadway. So the road takes your eye into the very centre of the painting. He then has tall trees on either side, usually without leaves, acting as a framework supporting either side of the painting. And if those trees can cast shadows, he'll use those shadows to step your eye into the painting. He loves having figures in his paintings as a cart and a horse, a little figure alongside here. The entrance to the village of Voisin is a superb example of Camille Pissarro's paintings. Now, Pissarro was the grand old man of the Impressionists. Whereas I said they were all born 1840, and then they died at the turn of the century. He was born 10 years earlier. He was born in 1830, and then just died after the turn of the century, dying in 1903. Now, because he was the grand old man of the Impressionists, he was the one that organised the eight Impressionist exhibitions. They went from 1874 to 1886. There was a gap of a couple of years because there was a Franco-Prussian war that raged around Paris during those years. And most Impressionists came over to England during those two years. Now, to be lovely if by 1886 it was all Hollywood and all rich and all famous, but it wasn't. The only thing by 1886 is people realised that these artists were serious and began taking their paintings more seriously. They didn't start buying them as early as 1886. So, Camille Pissarro. He loves to sit on a roadway. We can already see how bright the colours are. The blues is so much stronger and then the reds coming in as well. And it's a lovely summer's afternoon, South London up and Norwood. But look at the composition. You know, this word composition was a word that always used to frighten my students. But it's the way the artist puts the painting together. 
And I used to say, when the composition works, that word works. There's another word that, but if you don't fall out at one side or fall out at the other side, or it feels top heavy or it feels bottom heavy, it just it works perfectly. And Pissarro's composition was the road taking your eye into the very centre of the painting. He then has a sky without clouds and he loves having figures on the roadway itself. So this is the composition that Pissarro absolutely loved. The road takes your eye into the very centre of the painting. We then have the tall tree without leaves acting as a framework supporting either side of the painting. And this time we have the shafts of sunlight look taking your eye into the picture. And again, so it's not a completely bare canvas, there's a cart and a horse and figures walking along here. He likes having people in his paintings. So this is a composition that Pissarro absolutely loved. The road takes your eye into the very centre of the painting. Now we don't have a tree on that side without leaves, but we do have the tall tree on this side without leaves and a plume of smoke coming up here. And this time we have shadow, light, shadow, light, stepping your eye into the painting and again figures on the roadway. As Pissarro goes on we get more and more figures in his paintings. So you're now becoming familiar with the way Pissarro likes to have his composition. The road takes your eye into the very centre of the picture. We then have the tall trees on either side, used without leaves, acting as support and figures on the roadway. Here we're at Hampton Court, the great Crystal Palace which completely disappeared and was completely burnt down at the beginning of the 1900s and it's that building on this side along with the tall flag here which is our support here and then our huge set of trees are the support on this particular side. The eye takes your eye straight into the picture itself and again, I've never actually counted how many people we've got in this particular painting. But there must be getting on for about 50 people here in the painting. And if you look at the shadows here, this is photographed at lunchtime at noon. And you'll see as Pissarro goes on, he likes getting more and more and more people in his paintings. He loves busy paintings. Now, I've already mentioned we had these eight Impressionist exhibitions that Pissarro was the main figure who organised them. Now, I just wonder what would the critics have written about these particular exhibitions? And I've come across a review of one of the exhibitions which is so cruel and so personally vitriolic. It starts off... The Rue de la Pellier is a road of utter disasters. After a fire at the Opera House, there is now yet another disaster there. An exhibition has just opened which allegedly contains paintings. I enter, and my horrified eyes behold something quite terrible. Five or six lunatics, among them a woman, have joined together and exhibited their works. I have seen people rock with laughter in front of these pictures, but my heart bled when I saw them. These would-be artists call themselves Impressionists. They take a piece of canva, colour and brush, dab a few catches, patches of colour on them at random and sign the whole thing with their name. It is a delusion of the same kind as if the inmates of Bedlam had picked up stones from the wayside and imagined they had found diamonds. Someone should tell Monsieur Pissarro forcibly that trees are never violet, that the sky is never the colour of fresh butter, and that nowhere on earth are things seen as he paints them. If I walk along a boulevard, do I look like this? Do I lose my legs, my eyes, my nose, and turn into a shapeless blob? I must say this is really cool stuff and there's two things that are really fascinated me in this review. It is a delusion of the same kind as if the inmates of Bedlam, a lunatic asylum, had picked up stones from the wayside and imagined they had found diamonds. Now, stones from the wayside. The canvas here would cost you about a pound. The wooden frame around it be another pound. The paint would be about five or six pounds. 
You could paint that whole painting for about £10. The last Pissarro sold for £42 million. Now you need a lot of diamonds to find £42 million. But the best bit is a bit earlier on. Five or six lunatics, among them a woman, I thought, whoops, who is this woman? Well, it turns out to be Bet Morriso. Now, Bet Morriso's married name was Mrs. Manet. She was married to Eugene Manet, who was the brother of Edvard Manet, who loved painting her as a subject. And Bet Morriso exhibited in seven of the eight Impressionist exhibitions. The one exhibition she missed is when she had a little baby girl. And in Ben Morriso's paintings, you follow the little baby girl along with her sister growing up. I think this group would not have been included, it been complete without Bet Morriso. The paint is so gentle and so beautifully painted. There's her little daughter growing up and there's her sister again. And when you look at the very gentle, free, fluid way the landscape's painted, it really is so delicate and so gentle. I mean, I'm being a bit of a purist here today, and I'm saying they've got to be landscapes. But there's no doubt you could paint a portrait very much in an impressionistic style. And I must say the sitters, now they're not melancholic, and they're not sad, they're just introspective as they have this very introspective look and sit quite happily as they pose for Bette Morisot. And I must say, the freedom of the paintwork is just so gentle all the way through. And it's said that she was influenced by the Japanese print. And indeed, because that has fluid, simple shapes all the way through. And you've even got a Japanese fan here that she's included in this portrait. And there's that introspective look yet again. Anybody posing for Bette Morisot was only too happy to sit for her. That lovely interest. How anybody can refer to this painting as being painted by a lunatic, I really do not know. Look at those hands. They are so absolutely beautifully painted. Now, as I said, I am being a bit of a purist and saying Impressionism is only about painting landscape, but it obviously isn't. You can obviously paint figures very much in an Impressionistic style and so absolutely beautifully. But even so, Bette Morisot could go out in the open air and I must say her painting of the Seine here is just so beautiful and so free. And this beautiful free paintwork also goes into the actual drapery here. But yet again, just look at this light falling back on that face, so beautifully and so gently and so freshly seen. I think that group without Bette Morisot would not have been a complete group of Impressionist painters. So I said, I am being a bit of a purist in saying it could only got to be landscape, but obviously you could use the Impressionist technique when you came to paint beautiful portraits, as did Bette Morisot. So that was a wonderful lady who was so cruelly referred to in that really ridiculous review of the Impressionist exhibitions. Well, to come back to Camille Pissarro, it's the rail line going into Penge Railway Station, which is our feature taking us into the very centre of the painting. We do have the tall tree on that side, and it's matched by the high bank on this particular side. Now, it literally was, as he goes on, he goes to Pontoise, north of Paris, and Pontoise is set below a high bank. So as he goes on, the paintings get busier. Now, whereas the trees have been seen at either side, now we have the trees coming across and bending and going right the way into the distance. But we still have the roadway sneaking in on this corner here. Now, Pissarro had quite a few problems, especially when he went out painting in the winter time in the snow. That cold air blowing into his eyes caused him a lot of discomfort. So what he initially decided to do, which I think is very, very clever, is he went to Rouen. Now what he now did was to hire a room in a hotel on the first floor. So it meant he could now sit in the room and look through the window. So he didn't have to be troubled by any cold air blowing anymore.
and he could now become the town impressionist painter. But all the things we've seen in the composition is still here. The road is taking our eye into the centre of the painting. The high rooftops take her from the high banks that we've seen beginning and now it's the steeples that act as our support on either side of the painting. And sometimes these paintings become incredibly complicated with hundreds and hundreds of figures all the way through Rouen on a busy market day. And you can see that we've got hardly any sky now because he's really interested in the figures as they spill out into the marketplace. And it was, in fact, the critics which would stand where I am wanting to see minute detail. And that really isn't the way you look at an Impressionist painting. You look from where you are and you look at the whole Impressionist painting. And then from Rouen, he moved up to Paris. And he became the boulevard painter of Paris. Again, he was able to hire a room in a hotel so he could sit in the window and overlook. And you can see we've got the opera house at the end of the boulevard and the end of boulevard here. And the fountain, which is here, you can also see here. So he now does a whole series of paintings on the one subject. Now again, I'd say this. Now I'd say the sun is hitting the clouds, but it isn't getting through. So everything is seen in silhouette as the carriages and the figures go up and down the boulevard itself. But rather like the Sisley snow paint, uh, the Sisley painting I showed you, if you took this same scene on a late November day, now, there's no real strength in the sun. It just drifts across the buildings and then across the boulevard. And as there's no strength in the sun, there's no strength in the shadow. So that too just drifts along a gentle blue-gray. And this is exactly what the Diction of Art Artists meant. Colour isn't in an object, but the outcome of the way light is reflected from it, thus a matter of constant change. And can you imagine here, there's the opera house and here's the fountain. What would happen here if it rained? Well, that would make a tremendous difference to the scene. Now, the first thing is the rain is obliterating the opera house from the end of the boulevard, although we can still see the fountain over here. The rain now reflects the light from the sky and also the carriages have reflections as well. And everything becomes very blue, grey and cold in the background of the picture. But rather like Sisley, Pissarro brings ochres into the foreground of the painting. And honestly, you can even hear the clippity-clop, the spliggly splash of the carriages as they go up and down the boulevard. And he ends up, therefore, as the boulevard painter of Paris. But all the things we've seen in his compositions are still here. All right, the boulevard isn't quite in the very centre of the painting, it's just over at one side. But that takes our eye into the picture. We then have the tall trees with just a few leaves on the other side, acting as our support on either side of the painting. And this time, even with cyclists here, you've got the boulevard full of carriages going up and down the boulevard itself. A wonderfully lovely and busy painting. And can you imagine what would happen if you turned that on? Well, that would make a tremendous difference to the painting. And I must say, for an old man, this really is a very exciting painting. He's almost putting the paint on here with an actual palette knife with really thick reds and yellows and blues and this fabulous French ultramarine blue in the sky and these cold ice lemons in the lights themselves. It's only a small painting and it's in the National Gallery on Trafalgar Square. It's only about a foot by nine inches, a very small painting, but it really is an absolute gem. And the way he's applying this paint really does give us a foretaste for the way paint was to be used in the 20th century. So that's Camille Pissarro, the boulevard painter of Paris. And so we come to the final artist, Monet himself.
And he had a boat made as a studio, so you're literally in the water itself, a light cloud and boats. Monet's Boats of Pleasure really is a superb example of Monet's painting. And you can see him here, literally, in his little boat, with his canvas on the easel painting. Now, this was painted by his friend Manet of Monet in his little boat studio. So he could throw the anchor over so you're fully in the water itself. Water comes off the base of the picture, you have a sky with a light cloud and you have boats. Monet's Boats of Pleasure, also painted in 1872, is a superb example of Monet's painting. Now Monet really was the master of the Impressionists and he like all the others, as I said, they were all born in 1840, and in those years, you just lived 60 years and you died at the turn. Monet had a little trick up his sleeve. He decided not to die at the turn of the century. He decided to live an extra 26 years. He died in 1926. Now, because he lived this extra 26 years, he became the richest man in the whole of France. At one stage, he had 14 gardeners and four cooks. And it was said the best food in the whole of France could be had at Monet's house. Now, history of art books don't talk about money, but I really want to know how did it happen, when did it happen, and why did it happen? Well, it seems to have been the turn of the century. America fell in love with Paris. Hemingway came over, lots of composers came over, everybody fell in love with Paris in that first decade. And then the Russians also came over. I've been to the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. They have room after room after room of fabulous Impressionist paintings. They started to ring. I've been to Boston, I've been to Washington, you know, not major museums, but just full of wonderful Impressionist paintings. The Americans and the Russians just fell in love with Impressionism. And of course, they were reasonably priced at the beginning of the last century. And then I think the French panicked. They thought, golly, unless we buy some of these, they're all going to leave France. So that's when they started to buy the paintings as well. I'll show you what it was that Monet actually did with his money. But there is no doubt, water comes off the base of the picture. So you're fully in the water itself and you're evolved in the picture itself. Now I said when I was showing you those gentle tones of Sisley, I'd show you pure reds, pure blues, pure greens. Just look at the dash and the panache of this particular painting. Absolutely wonderful. The confidence of Monet is truly amazing. Pure reds all the way through. But look, a sky with the light clouds and water coming off the base of the painting. Every time you're fully involved with the subject. Again, this is the favourite Impressionist sky. These cotton woolly clouds against a pale blue. But notice boats is the subject. Notice again the water is coming off the base of the picture, so you're fully in the water itself. And up until Monet, shadows had just gone a dark brown. And Monet realised there was always a reflected light coming back of those shadows. So light comes back into the shadows themselves. Monet just is absolutely wonderful. Oh, I never know when that's going to happen. This is a projector telling me it wants me to change its slides. So I shall do that. So you can just see the way that Monet painted with such confidence and such dash and panache. And surely this has got to be one of the most famous Impressionist paintings ever painted, the poppy field. And why I like this, and nobody's picked up on this idea, I'd say that Monet and his wife and his son Paolo went for a picnic in the meadow. And when he started the painting, he had his wife and his son standing at the top. And then after he put them in at the top of the painting, he says, look, why don't you walk down to the bottom of the painting? And he drops them in again. Because if you look, it's the same two people. I think that's absolutely a wonderful touch is that. But Monet really is the absolute master. Now, he used to love coming over here to England. He loved those thick pea super fogs that we used to get coming off the Thames.
He was, after all, staying in the Savoy Hotel. He had a whole suite to himself on the Savoy Hotel, and he would walk over Westminster Bridge. Now, I always wondered for a long time why all these paintings of the House of Parliament were in the evening time and then at night time. It turns out, opposite the Houses of Parliament was the Victorian St Thomas's Hospital. It's obviously being knocked down and this modern hospital has been put in its place. He was able to get an evening pass so he could get into the hospital. And he could mostly sit on one of the corridor floors overlooking the House of Parliament. Now, you could only get an evening pass into the hospital. So that's why all these paintings are painted after six o'clock in the evening. And this is what the series paintings are all about. He gets the same subject almost from an identical point of view. And there's a setting sun look. Here's this ghostly apparition of the Houses of Parliament lifting up off the water. And I always feel in the water, you feel you could walk on that water. It feels so absolutely solid. So this is what the series paint. Look, I think that's moonlit. I think there's a very cold moon up here. And look again how solid the water feels and then this ghostly apparition of the Houses of Parliament lifting off the Thames itself. So this is what the series paintings are all about. The same subject taken time and time and time again. There's a very dark setting sun, a very mysterious painting. But the composition is almost identical on each of the canvases. So this is what Monet did. And you can just see just this amazing movement of paintwork all the way through. The freedom, the dash and the panache is absolutely amazing. And then you can feel you could actually walk on the water itself. Now, we've already had Pissarro going to Rouen. And as I said, these artists like to keep each other company. So Monet now goes to Rouen. But what he becomes obsessed with is the west portal of Rouen Cathedral. Now, I was only there for a morning. Now, this is the west portal, so the sun is coming up in the east behind. And then as the morning went on, it slowly starts to brighten up. And then as you go on even more, the sun starts to come across as the sky brightens. And of course, eventually, the sun will come right the way around and will actually strike the actual west portal of Rouen Cathedral. Now, it is amazing that Monet did 42 versions of this cathedral front at different kind of effects. And it was the great Paul Cezanne who said about Monet, he is only an eye but my God, what an eye. Because Monet could just see all of these differences in the four. They weren't all done in one go. Twenty were done. And then Durand Royal, who was Monet's dealer, had opened a gallery in New York to sell to the Americans. And he wrote to Monet saying, go back to Rouen and do another 20. And Monet did a second 22. Now I'm going to show you just eight of these West Portals. And we start off with this kind of murky, miserable Monday. There's no real sunlight dropping here. It's just muddy, it's murky, or oh, perhaps it's not going to be a, a nice day. But as the morning goes on, it starts to freshen. And suddenly you start to get this light coming through with a kind of blue mist enveloping the whole of the West Portal. Perhaps it's going to be a nice day. The morning goes on and the sun starts to pick out the detailing of the West Portal. It's still a dark sky, but we are beginning to feel a little bit of warmth coming onto the West Portal. And then as we go on through the morning, the, sun is, the sky is still quite dark, but the sun is getting brighter and is getting stronger as it gets swings around to almost eventually to shine directly onto the West Portal. And now the sky has really lightened. And you can see each difference is just a fractional difference that Monet is actually holding into his memory as he puts the image down on the canvas. We then come towards lunchtime when it's now sitting directly, the sun is hitting the west portal and our only part now with any shadow is the deep inset rose window.
And you can see how every single composition is almost identical in the way it's placed on the canvas itself. We then come round to the afternoon when a heat haze now starts to appear and we simply get the sun just shimmering in this heat haze, the light now even going into the rose window and lighting that as well. And then eventually towards the end of the afternoon the sun starts to set behind the building that Monet is in and we now just get a soft shadow coming across the base of Rouen Cathedral. And every single one is almost placed identically. It really is incredible that Monet could see 42 differences in that West Portal. Cezanne said of Monet, he is only an eye but my God, what an eye. Now the Museum d'Orsay have in fact got five of these West Portal paintings and I must say they really are rather a dull set of the paintings. Now Monet ran into a major problem in living until 1926 and that problem was the Industrial Revolution. Suddenly all these small villages, Argentoy, Marleroy, Pontoise, Auvers, were all being swamped with the rail tracks going out of Paris and then industry going out of Paris. And Monet was having to go further and further out of Paris to find the locations he wanted to work in. So eventually he went 32 miles west to a little village called Giverny, just outside Rouen. And he's now very, very rich. So the first thing he does is to redirect the river Ept and with his 14 gardeners creates a huge water lily lake. Monet's garden is absolutely fantastic with this huge water lily lake. I mean, it really is lovely that one man did reap the rewards of Impressionism. And it just is, Monet's garden is just fabulous. Now, it's not a formal, laid-out garden. It's just very informal, and it has about five different motifs that come into blossom at different times of the year. So Monet can now create his own subjects within his garden. One area is in fact the colourful pathway that leads up to the house. It says it was in fact a cider farm which was more or less derelict when Monet took it over. It just is fabulous and here's a colour photograph of Monet in the rose part of the garden. Although I think this photograph is even more interesting. I think with Monet just standing here and the wisteria on the little Japanese bridge, the huge weeping willows here and then the water lilies floating on the surface. I do think that's a very magical photograph. And it really is wonderful that just one of the Impressionists did reap the rewards of Impressionism. And again, this is one of the subjects then, the little pathway that goes from the house down to the lake. Another, and again, you see each one of these actually gets the whole treatment throughout the season, different lighting effects, different colours, different blossoms. There's just one of the many paintings he did of the pathway leading down from the lake to the house itself. And then another of the motifs was, in fact, the little Japanese bridge with wisteria on it. And that, again, gets the whole treatment as a whole series. And I must say, some of these paintings, the differences are so subtle. It's almost as though they're identical paintings. But it's just the simpleness and the subtlety of the movement of the paint and the water lilies floating on the surface itself. And the house itself, was, as I said, it was derelict when Monet took it over and recreated it with this lovely pink wash going all around the outside. And then to go into the dining room, I mean, most Victorian dining rooms were dank, dark kind of places. Just look at the blues coming, the, the, the yellows coming all the way through here. And then the blue tires again echoed in the napkins and the yellow echoed in the bowls on the table itself. And then kitchens were also dark, dank kind of places. Just look at the blue tiles coming all the way through here. Do you know, Monet's Garden is now a huge tourist centre for the tourists to go, the Americans, the Japanese and so on. And there's only one place that has more tourists than Monet's Garden, and that's the Eiffel Tower. So it just shows how popular Monet is and Monet's Garden is. And again, here it is that I'm sitting on Monet's little garden seat on the lovely pathway itself.
And here's Monet in exactly the same pose. What an amazing coincidence that was. Now, you can see when I photographed the lakes when I was there, or rather, this, sorry, is Monet's photograph. The next one is the one of the lakes when I was there. This is Monet's photograph. And you can see that he has really managed to grow the water lilies spectacularly well. Because I gather they are a difficult plant to grow. I mean, if you look today, you can see they've been having real trouble growing the water lilies. But then Monet also had trouble. And the trouble was Giverny was a dust-tracked little village. And all the horses and all the carts were creating dust, and that dust was coming over, settling on the water lily lake, and inhibiting the growth of the water lilies. So Monet paid to have the whole town tarmacked. He was that kind of rich. There were some huge trees that were literally miles away from where Monet, Monet was kind of painting them, shimmering in a distant heat haze. And you can see these trees going along and then bending and going right into the distance. A wonderful painting. And Monet heard they were going to, all going to be cut down and made into telegraph poles. Now, even though they were two miles from the house, Monet simply went and bought them all so he could carry on painting them. I think it really is that one man reaped the rewards of Impressionism. Now, all the paintings we've been looking at so Oh, just sorry, do you want me to ahead of myself? Just to show you where Monet's house is. This is the Paris Rouen motorway. After 32 miles, you come across this. I love the French. They know you are visually literate. They don't say Monet, they don't say Giverny, they just show you the water lilies, the little Japanese bridge, and the little pathway going to the house. And you know that your next turn is off the motorway, you go along the side of the Seine, you go over the bridge, and you come back to Monet's garden here. And you can see how he redirected the river Ept to create the water lily lakes in the grounds of his garden. It really is a fabulous place to visit. Now, all the paintings we've been looking at so far have literally been this kind of size. A literally a convenient canvas which is absolutely ideal for putting underneath one's arm as you walk out to location. In other words, they've all been about the size that we can see here. In his 80th year, in 1920, Monet had a huge studio built in the grounds of his garden. It was an absolutely huge studio. And in this studio, he started to create really huge canvases. You know, I've worked out that I'm not a very successful painter because my palette isn't big enough. Just look at the size of this palette here, absolutely huge. And look at these huge canvases. And then Monet gets the idea of joining these canvases together. We started off looking at this aerial map of Paris, and I pointed out the Jeu de Pomme here, which was in fact where they used to play tennis, which is now the Impressionist collection. In 1920, the Parisians gave Monet this little building here. It's called the Orangery because that's where they used to grow oranges. And Monet was given a completely free hand with what he did inside this building. And he had two huge oval galleries built. They literally are huge and the paintings go all the way around you. It is as if you're standing in the middle of a Monet water lily painting. The water comes off the base of the canvas, the water goes off the top of the canvas, you see the clouds reflected in the water, and you see the water lilies floating on the surface. I say it's the largest area of canvas painted with one subject in the whole of the 20th century. The difference between the two galleries is, in one gallery you have the trees in the foreground, and in the other gallery, you don't. You just have the water lily lakes themselves. I've seen people walk in here and their jaws have just dropped. They thought they were going into a gallery. They were looking at lots of little small paintings on the wall. And suddenly you've got Monet's water lilies going all the way around you. And it's as though you're standing in the middle of an impressionist painting.
you can see in this particular one, there's, I don't think it's rain. I think it's a little will-o'-the-wisp or a little disturbing of the water. As you can see, the water has just been disturbed here in an amazing way. But the critics said that these were pure wallpaper, they were pure decoration, and they were the decadent end of Impressionism, and they ought to be ignored. But in the 60s and 70s, an American called Jackson Pollock, we used to call him Jack the Dripper, because he used to drip paint wildly onto canvases on his studio floor. And he created what the critics called action painting, the action of splashing the paint. Now the critics said, my word, that's marvellous, that's wonderful, we've never seen anything like that before. Until somebody pointed out, if you go to within three or four inches of Monet's water lilies in the orangery, they are pure splashes of paint. And the amazing thing is, though, as you walk away from these splashes of paint, they slowly transform themselves into the water lily lakes. And the critics turned completely about face. They said, these are the summit of Impressionism and one of the wonders of 20th century painting. But I do have to say, they really are absolutely impossible to photograph. You've got to go and see them for yourselves. I mean, it's not for my lack of trying to photograph them. I went there in the 1950s. I went there in the 1960s. I went there in the 1970s, and I went there in the 1980s, and I went there in the 1990s. And I've now been in this brand new century. I was there on the 14th of January 2000, and I was three days late. This was the notice on the door to the orangery. From January 11th, 2000, the museum will be closed for about two years for building works. The public reopening should take place at the end of 2001. Well, I was busy in 2000. I was busy in 2001, and I was there at the beginning of 2002. And as, as I started walking towards the orangery, my heart started to sink, because obviously they were still doing things. Now, it's hard to see the notion of the door because of the reflected light, but you can just about make out. It says reopening early 2004. Well, I was busy in 2002. I was busy in 2003. In 2004, I was there, and there were no more notices on any more doors because there simply weren't any doors. And if you also look, there aren't any walls. Either. I don't know where the paintings went. They didn't go anywhere else in Paris, but they can hardly be kept here. Now, this is 2004, this is 2005, this is 2006, and this is 2007. And this is the problem. These little people here, you queue and queue and queue for hours and hours to get into the orangery. And then when you eventually get in, they've allowed far too many people in. You literally cannot see the paintings for all the figures. I've been in that gallery when I was the only person there. Now it's just so crowded and so packed. I haven't been back since 2007. I just felt so demoralized by just the crowds and rushing figures in there. I think I may well go in, say, the next summer, something like in 2015, perhaps in the autumn time at the end of the day. And hopefully I'll be able to photograph myself with these wonderful, amazing paintings and not have to have all these crowds of other people around as well. As I said, the largest singer of canvas painted with one subject in the whole of the 20th century. The orangery really is absolutely amazing. But I only managed to get that amount of room in which to stand in front of these fantastic paintings by Monet. Monet dies in 1926, and that really was the end of Impressionism. Other people tried to keep it going, but it really was the end when Monet had died. I started off showing you Ernest May's absolutely amazing triptych. I don't know who Ernest May was to put these three pictures in one frame and insist they must never be changed or never be damaged. Do go to Paris. I've been to Paris for lunch. If you get an early train 
and then you get there for lunchtime. You can then spend the whole afternoon in Paris and come back on a late train, and you can bring the price right down to about eighteen pounds. I've been there many times just for lunch. You can get to Paris quicker than you can get to Liverpool. So it's well worth a visit. Do go in and go and have a look at Ernest May's absolutely wonderful triptych. You saw how Alfred Sisley always had the bank going off on the left-hand side, a low horizon line with a large expanse of sky directly above water. The Ile Saint Denis is a superb example of Alfred Sisley's painting. And then Camille Pissarro, I mean, you saw how he had a roadway taking your eye into the painting. He then had tall trees on either side, used without leaves, acting as a framework, and if those trees can cast shadows, he'll use those shadows to step your eye into the painting. He then has figures, a cart and a horse, a little figure alongside here. The entrance to the village of Voisin is a superb example of Camille Pissarro's painting. And finally, the great Monet. You saw how he had a boat made into a studio. So you've got to drift it out into sense, you're fully in the water. Water comes off the base of the picture, a sky with a light cloud and boats. Monet's Boats of Pleasure is a superb example of Monet's painting. I don't know who Ernest May was, but he was a genius to put those three pictures together in one frame and insist they must never be changed and never damaged. Do take the train to Museum d'Orsay. It really is an incredible conversion from a railway station into a museum. Take the escalators up and go up to the main Impressionist gallery. And as you can see, there's a seat just opposite the triptych, so you can sit here and enjoy those three paintings. And then what I want you to do is just have a look where the attendant is. Because if he's not in the actual gallery, will you unhook it off the wall and bring it home for me? I would love to own that particular triptych. As is everybody, this is my impression of the Impressionists. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you.